Welcome everyone, Costini here with a discussion about Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires and talk about some of the worst campaigns for beginner players. Now these campaigns in general are going to be pretty bad for anyone playing the game, even veteran players, either because of issues with the mechanics or issues with the lords in question, their starting positions, their weak effects, as well as potentially issues with the races that these legendary lords belong to, or a combination of all of these things. On top of that, it's worth understanding what makes a legendary lord strong and what makes a legendary lord weak. A strong legendary lord, like for instance, someone like, if we look at uh, the Greenskin, someone like Rom the Ponch or Grimgor, Azak. What makes them good isn't like, oh, you can win battles, anyone can win battles. Or, oh, you can take territory, you can beat your enemies. That's not what really matters. What matters is the following question. How fast can you expand? How much territory can you take? How quickly can you take it? How many armies can you maintain? How difficult are the individual battles? How many of those battles do you have to fight manually? Or can you go for a significant portion of your campaign being able to auto resolve battles? Those are the kind of questions that do matter. Because whenever I make one of these videos, someone comes along, oh, this race isn't too bad, to which my reply would be, it doesn't matter if you can win battles with any legendary lord. What matters is how effective are you in playing the campaign when you're playing at the highest possible level trying to use the full potential of a particular legendary lord or a particular race. And number five, we have Lord Mazdamundi of the Lizardmen. Mazdamundi represents some of the worst things about any Total War Warhammer campaign. Specifically, what happens in pretty much every Total War uh, game that's out there is that early game is the hardest part of any particular campaign. And once you overcome that, things can be a lot easier. Mazda Mundi, I feel, embodies this very, very well when we're talking about Total War Warhammer 3 in particular. If we look at his faction effects, he doesn't get anything really great over here. He gets, oh, minus 50% construction cost for... Uh, star chamber buildings and right cost minus 30 percent doesn't really matter as much as you might think yes the right cost especially the right to primeval glory glory can be pretty decent but it's not really good faction effect as for skill effects he isn't that great in that respect either if we look at him having a special skill line because he has a couple of effects over here but it's nothing too great and even his Lord effects is just like, oh, you get some magical benefits and a unit experience bonus per turn. I think Mazda Mundi genuinely is one of the worst legendary lords when it comes to faction effects. He is as generic as you probably can get in the game, which wouldn't necessarily be a problem unless it was paired with a really terrible start position, which it is. So if I toggle the Fog of War, something I do with a mod, then we can see we have an army of slanish here, but this one is very easy to deal with. However, the one down south over here, not so much. It's not necessarily because of the army itself. In fact, the army is a pathetic uh, force. Rather, it's because of the Keeper of Secrets that's leading that army that you're going to have a pretty hard time fighting this battle, especially on a higher difficulty. My personal advice, since you do start with a tier 2 barracks, my personal advice is get the combination of Saurus Warriors and Saurus Spears. Like two Sp Saurus Spears, uh, for instance, should be able to help you deal with that particular Keeper of Secrets. But then there's another issue, a fairly major one at, at that, and that is the issue of Skeggy. Skeggy is a formidable fortress controlled by the Norskans, no. and Norskans are quite capable of defeating you in a one-on-one -on -one fight, as well as having a high level of chaos corruption. And then, of course, you do have the Savage Orcs, and you have a difficult time expanding to the south, because uh, the territory here can be difficult to break through. And then, of course, you have Marcus Wolfart over here, um, down all the way down Agreed. south. If you move quickly enough and you wipe him out quickly enough, that's not really going to be uh, much of an issue. 
But to be quite honest, it's really the early game, the first few turns, like the first five, ten turns that are an absolute freaking nightmare when you're playing as Mazdamundi that are the main issue. If you can overcome that and conquer all of the territory all, all the way down here, the campaign should be significantly easier to, uh, to tackle. You can then confederate the other Lizardman faction, capture a significant portion of territory, and expand across the campaign map. But then it kind of becomes a pretty boring campaign. So it represents some of the worst things that any campaign can have in the game. A very difficult start with a really boring and lackluster mid and late game. And that is Mazmundi's campaign in a nutshell. Uh, you also need to conquer basically all of Lustria, which isn't necessarily the f uh, the best experience in the world. It's a large territory, There's and navigating it can be... a uh, an annoying uh, situation. So between the lack of faction effects, having a fairly generic uh, legendary lord that's only really going to give you some magical benefits, uh, it's not going to be a great campaign experience for you to deal with. Now at number four we have Ungrim Iron Fist of the Dwarves. The Dwarves are a fairly broken race currently in Total War Warhammer 3. Too many costs associated with the units and buildings. Too little growth unless you have provincial control and research. Issues with casualty replenishment, lack of flanker units. I can go on and on and on. But the dwarves do have issues. However, the dwarves do have the potential of having a really good army. Because they do have units with high armor, very high armor, and high leadership. So that means if you're fighting a lot of these battles manually or auto resolve, you can take very few casualties in comparison to many other factions in the game. The, the problem with casualty or replenishment is a severe one though, because it means you're just going to have to fight a lot of battles manually in the course of the campaign, which are going to be pretty boring. But that's not why this campaign is so horrible for beginner players, it's why the campaign is bad overall, but... Why is this campaign especially bad for beginners? Well, if we look at our starting yes. situation, we don't oh really my. have any friendly factions with the exception of the Ostermark. And the last thing you want to do so, when playing this campaign greetings is on behalf the of the Empire. Ostermark because that's just going to piss off both Draikai and Azak. And you don't want to end up having to fight both Draikai and Azak in this campaign. Beyond that, you also have one of the main Dwarven mechanics, the Grudges, and they're all over the place over here for Ungrim. So take the Silver Pinnacle over here, which means that you're going to be moving into the Darklands. Like, if, like the way Warhammer 3 works at the moment is if you're moving into a province, you kind of want to take over the entire province for commandments, for control, to deal with corruption in this particular case, so you don't have to deal with vampire corruption. And this is one of your main Grudges. Another one is to Take down Azak. Sure, one of the more powerful legendary lords in the game. Just take him down. Easy, right? Oh, actually, it's not that simple. Take down, uh, take down Vlad or just win a couple of va battles against Vlad van, van Karstein. Another one of the more powerful legendary lords. So, the starting situation, the starting grudges are not the kind of things that lend themselves for a good campaign in general. But especially if you're a new player. It's very easy for this situation to get completely out of control. And that's why this this is one of the main reasons why this campaign is not recommended to new players. On top of that, here's the thing about this campaign. If you're playing this campaign, what you really want to do is you want to take this particular province and move down south. I've done a whole campaign overview guide for Ungram what he wants to do in this campaign. Like, he may want to go all the way down here to deal... Because if you're taking Dead Rock Gap and you want to take it to deal with Skarsnik so you relieve the press pressure on Forgrim, if you don't, he'll lose. Because between Skarsnik and Warzag over here... Uh, Forgrim will lose, and guess who they're gonna be coming after once they're done with that? That means certainly Skarsnik, so they're gonna come after you, so you want to ensure Forgrim survives. In order to do that, you need to take this province, and you don't want to give it to just Forgrim, because it's just gonna leave a flank exposed to him and create complications in his campaign in terms of his plan to deal with the Warzag. Beyond that, though, if you take this province... Well, you're leaving yourself exposed to threats, so you pretty much will have to deal with him. It's a really bad campaign situation to deal with. I mean, it's not sunshine and rainbows for Forgrim either, but he's in a much better situation. 
Here's another thing, the army yes. that Ungram has. Ungram is a Slayer leader. He starts, he doesn't start with the barracks, he starts with the, Sla the Slayer Shrine in Karakadren. The problem with Slayers is that they have zero armor. They, ha they are unbreakable when it comes to their leadership. They have good melee stats, though not so exceptional when we think about the melee stats. Their units that are comparable are much more durable than Slayers. Not unbreakable, though, but pretty durable. The problem is Slayers, because of their zero armor, take significant damage in any engagement. And this is an issue for, this would be an issue for any race, but is especially an issue for a race with poor casualty replenishment, like you guessed it, the dwarves. So, you have a poor army, a poor campaign starting situation, grudges that are all over the place that the best thing you can do in your campaign is ignore them because you have other things to deal with, with that, and you have a legendary lord that Outside of being a good fighter in battle himself, he doesn't really have any significant campaign benefits that we really care about, with the exception of Doom Seekers, which gives a lot of casualty replenishment for for Slayers. But you are required to get everything all the way here in order to get Doom Seekers. So yeah, Ungram's skill line isn't that that great. He doesn't have a good army. His focus in his campaign isn't a good one, and his starting position is pretty bad. And then, even if none of those were an issue, he's a legendary lord for flat out one of the worst races in the game. Don't play a dwarven campaign as one of your first campaign. Or if you're going to play a dwarf campaign, the only one I could reasonably recommend as a starting one is Grumbrindle way over here. And it's not like Grumbrindle has a cakewalk of a campaign either, it's not. But at least he has some of the tools to deal with it. Ungram doesn't, and Ungram's campaign starting situation is a lot worse than the vast majority of other legendary lords in the game. And number three, we have Cetra the Imperishable for the Tomb Kings. You gotta love his intro speech. The King of Kings, Lord of the Shifting Sands, Eternal Ruler of Mankind. What is he? The Immortal Emperor? Well, if he's the mortal emperor, he's a pretty poor choice to be the eternal ruler of mankind. What's the issue with Cetra? Well, where to begin, really? Start position, campaign situation, a legendary lord? There's a lot of problems when it comes to Cetra. Now, to be clear, Cetra is really powerful when we're thinking about his faction effects. He gets a growth benefit and a construction time benefit for all buildings. This is actually more substantial than one might realize because it means he can get, get buildings very quickly in his campaign in general. Then his skill line is actually pretty solid. Here's the problem though. The Tomb Kings are the kind of race that can have a very hard start in their campaigns regardless. The problem is that they can only have one army for about 14-15 turns or so. And you may not necessarily want to get that second army very very quickly because once you do unlock a dynasty over here, your research rate is going to slow down by 30%. So one of the smarter things is you, if you can do it in any Tomb King campaign, is to start researching a dynasty and then just stop with one turn left, switch over to researching another dynasty. But etc., you're kind of in a really bad position in your campaign. Now, to be clear, if you can overcome that situation, it is going to be a really powerful faction but it is a pretty miserable starting position. So Cetra himself uh, only starts with a um, Bone Shaper, so he can only recruit Chariots, and he starts with the Tier 1 settlement. Now, Camry is a good settlement. The province it's in is a good province, but just starting with Tier 1 is just a slap. Like, if he started with a Tier 2 settlement, that would actually be a much better situation. If he could have an extra army, that would be a much better situation. It's just the confluence of events all added together that make this campaign genuinely miserable for any player on any level, but especially for a new player. Because, okay, Tomb Kings require structures in order to increase uh, their unit capacity to be able to recruit units. That means you need a lot of regions, you need a lot of provinces to really get effective armies. Now, the units themselves are for free, but when you can only have one army, and if you're playing on any kind of decent difficulty, or any difficulty there, any enemy will eventually throw a full stack against you, 
when you're playing on any difficulty and you're dealing with another with full uh, with other full stacks, it's going to be a pretty rough time. And it's not like you have an easy situation. To the north, you have Scarbrand, and you can bet he's going to declare war on you. He has a particular liking to raise Numas to the ground, which actually is a bigger issue than one might realize, because you might not be able to sell it back. Like, Numas is the vulnerable point of your empire. Now, on top of that, and it gets even worse from this point, Scarbrand isn't necessarily the biggest issue. Nomas is something that you can easily deal with, fair enough. But then you have the Netra uh, Necrox uh, Brotherhood. And what they're going to do is they're flat out uh, going to recruit at least half a stack or even a full stack, depending on the difficulty you're going to play on. So that's a really rough one. And they have a Terrorgeist in their army, which is really fun. Then you have Manfred, right. who's one of the more powerful legendary lords in the game. I mean, vampire towns in general have powerful legendary lords. And then you have Volkmar, Forek, uh, and Arkan all the way over here. So you're surrounded by enemies, your territory is exposed, and you don't have the tools to actually defend it because you only have one army for 15 turns. 15 turns is a significant chunk of the early game as it currently stands and that is where the issues are for Cetra. he just doesn't have the tools to deal with such an exposed and vulnerable starting position he has a lot of enemies he has to deal with the books as well it's a really rough campaign situation now to be clear he actually benefits from a change that creative assembly made where they removed uh, a lot of the Salmon battles from the game. So actually having uh, actually being able to fight the garrisons here in Qatar, Nomas and the Springs of Eternal Life on an open field is actually a benefit to him. It makes this campaign situation much more bearable, at least in the first few turns. But then you still have to deal with the Brotherhood. Then you still have to deal with Manfred. Then you have to deal with all these other issues. And again, you don't have the tools. You don't have the units. Your settlements are going to take time to build up. And you're going to constantly be under threat because of the various factions you have to deal with during the course of this campaign. Now, if you can manage that, you do have a pretty powerful late game and even mid game. If you can take over the entirety of Camry and Araby, you will have a pretty powerful empire. But it's a big if. And therein lies the issue. Even a veteran player, like even someone with a great deal of experience, will find this campaign a particularly miserable one. For a new player, stay the hell away from it, really. Like, if you want to play the Tomb Kings, there are much better campaigns available. In particular, Ark in the Black is a good choice if you are just starting with the Tomb Kings. Or even Kalida is a much better choice, though you will have to potentially deal with Forek Ironbrow over here. But be but Arkan and Kalida are much better campaign choices. Cetra is one of the worst. He has a lot of late game potential, and one shouldn't dismiss the faction wide benefits he gets or the skill tree benefits he gets, because they are the most powerful of all the Tomb King uh, Legendary Lords in the long term, but early game, he's in a really rough uh, spot. And number two, we have Emperor Karl Franz of the Empire. The Empire is in a really rough situation as a race in the game currently, one of the weaker races available at the moment. Now, they do have a good economy through the Weaving House, through... Uh, through the paved roads. They do have quite a few economic benefits through research, through the structures they have, and they do have quite a few uh, recruitment options. Cavalry, infantry, artillery, really good artillery with Hellstorm rocket batteries in particular being quite effective in battles, and great cannons being quite effective against walls. Here's the issue. Although the Empire certainly has some late game potential, their lords and heroes are mediocre at best, or really weak at worst. Some of them are flat out useless in battle, like for instance, Huntsman Generals as a DLC lord, they're completely useless in an actual battle situation just because they are struggling to get shots off. There's issues with range units at the moment in the game, significant issues when it comes to range units. Ready. So there's issues with the faction when it comes to their lord and hero choices, and on top of that, their early game army is a weak, one of the weaker ones in the game. The problem is, 
There's two issues. One, the units themselves don't necessarily have good stats, but there are races that have weak early game units like the Greenskins. But here's the thing. You're looking at buying an archer. An archer is 350 and it's 88 upkeep. You have a good economy, but you don't have such a great economy that you can mass these units. Like the recruitment cost is pretty low. The upkeep is too high as I see it, for the quality of the units that you're getting. So this is this is what you can get at tier 1 with a barracks. That's provided, of course, you have both DLCs for the game. At tier 2, you get crossbowmen, the upkeep starts going up and up and up. And the armor, the leadership, it's not great on these units. Flat out, greenskins have a better early game army than you do. Like, if you were to take the Greenskin army and just give it to the Empire, the Empire would be substantially better. But when we're looking at these units, they're not really worth it. So they have significant early game issues in terms of their armies, significant issues in terms of their lords and heroes. And that's before going into the Imperial Authority system. So in the Imperial Authority system is this bar. You want to keep it above one. For the benefits you get, you certainly don't want to go low because you start losing growth, control, economic. And then if you if it gets to minus 10, you get a civil war where all the electric counts declare war on you. Now, to be honest, if not for the minus growth and control from that you would get from having such low imperial authority, I would say, you know what? I could take that civil war. And hell, you could even win it. As opposed to the situation that you have to deal with in this campaign, which is running around like a headless chicken trying to keep the Empire together while dealing with a really broken system. The problem is, uh, the problem is this, you also have the fealty system. And Come then. you have limited Only diplomatic Sigma's options God with Ulrich. other Imperial yes. factions. You can't get the military alliance, you can't get the defensive alliance, which means that for other armies except Karl Franz himself, because he does have replenishment in neutral territory, or, uh, yeah, in neutral territory, with the exception of Karl Franz himself, you're not going to be able to replenish an electric count territory. And the thing is, you lose imperial authority if they lose their capital. So Talabaim, in the case of Talabekland, or uh, uh, Hergig in the case of Hawkland, which is almost certainly going to happen in pretty much every campaign because of thanks to Festus, the Leech Lord, or Big Haven in the case of the Ostromark, another comment. thing that's likely going to happen in every campaign, maybe even the Talabim. So it's very falls. easy to lose Imperial authority, and you need to try and keep the Empire together by aiding these Elector Counts. The problem is you're doing this in a campaign where you're not getting their territory, so you're not going to have the economic potential. You do start with one of the best provinces in the entire game, but first you need to conquer it against rebels who have a major fortress no. over here in Helmgard. Honestly, you should start with Helmgard. It would make the campaign starting situation that much better to deal with. But the fact that you actually have to take a, a fortress that, uh, that has a pretty powerful garrison and will likely have an army in it is not a great starting situation. And that's just the start. Then you also have to deal with uh, legendary lords like Festus. Like your best campaign plan if you're playing as Carl Francis to deal with the rebels within five turns. Then build up like a full stack of troops. Then get the second stack. Get a couple of units for that. Like you will want to march with a stack and a half. Mainly of archers if you have the DLC for them. If you don't have the DLC for them, you're going to have a rough situation. And then... Once you deal with Festus, the next logical thing you want to do is go take Sylvania, which is going to be a hard fight. So the early game situation of this campaign is brutal, and it doesn't necessarily get better in the long term. Yes, if you can unify the entirety of the Empire, gain all of their territory, gain all of their territory for, them, for yourself, you do get significant benefits through the various items right. and the various units the various uh, state troopers you can get from uh, from the Empire. That is a substantial amount of power you can have in Bring your campaign, but the early game situation is really, really weak. And there lies the major issue of this particular campaign. It is genuine misery to play it for most of it. And when you do succeed, yeah, you steamroll every single one of your enemies because you do get a pretty good late game army. You get the Electra... Uh, Electron Count State Troopers, you get 
all those items, but actually handling the system is horrible because of the limited dem diplomatic options and the fact that in order to confederate one of these Welcome, factions Mike. and thus gain their territory, declaring war will cost you imperial authority. So in order, in order to get one of these factions on your side, you need to get to a VLT level of 10, and then you get the confederation option. The problem is it costs you uh, imperial authority to be able to confederate. So this system is completely broken in more ways than one. You can cheese it, you can abuse it. How do you abuse it? Well, let's say this particular settlement get, uh, gets raised to the ground and Boris comes over here falls. and takes it. You'll usually then get an event where you either allow the faction that took that territory to keep it or to force them to give them back. If you um, if you force them to give them uh, to give it back, you get a bit of imperial authority. This is how you cheese it. You come over here. Let's say Hawkland, for instance, still is alive for whatever reason. You come over here, uh, and the settlement has been raised to the ground. You come over here. You take it over. You give it to Midland. The event will pop off. You abuse that to get a significant amount of imperial authority. Even then, this campaign is broken, it's bad, it's terrible. And yes. even though it's a recommended campaign for beginners, it's one of the worst campaigns flat out in the entire game, and certainly for a beginner player, because you will not learn the lessons you need to succeed in Total War. You will have a pretty bad experience, you have a pretty bad Legendary Lord in a pretty bad race with a horrible starting situation. Finally, and number one, and easily one of the worst campaigns in the game flat out, and certainly the worst for a new player to dive into, is Kislev. And I'm not just saying Katrin here, no, I'm talking about Kislev in the sense of Katrin and Kostalton. Boris Ursus is one of the more recommended campaigns for a beginner if you leave his starting province and go over here for the Frozen Landing, but Katrin's situation is a lot worse. Same with Kostalton. To begin with, they both have significantly weaker armies than Boris Ursus does. They also have a much worse situation in their campaigns. Because if you're playing as Boris Ursus, it's very easy to just take the course of your campaign. You have so many options in terms of the territory you're going to take, who you bother dealing with, how you deal with them. And having that kind of freedom of movement in a campaign is actually quite important uh, in having a good campaign. Whereas if you're playing Katrin and Castalton, you're kind of stuck dealing with the same things over and over and over and over again. Now, mind you, it's not too much freedom if you're playing as Boris Ursus over here. You do have to do some of the same things in every campaign, but you at least have flexibility. If you're None playing as Katrin or Kostalatin, you do not have the flexibility. If you're playing as Katrin, you're always going to want to deal with these Norskans and then go deal with Frat immediately after. If you don't, then basically everything that's north here in Kislev, including Krakadrak uh, and maybe even Prague, will collapse. Maybe even Kostalatin, which you don't want to happen because it will leave you dealing with all of these things on your own. You want to keep these minor factions alive like Krakadrak, Kostaltin, Prague, you want to keep them alive or gain their territory for yourself. Like you may want to take Prague for yourself, but you certainly, in an ideal world, keep Krakadrak alive and obviously keep Kostaltin alive. Actually, keeping Kostaltin alive is a pretty important Only thing I in a Kisa, control. in a campaign, as any of the Kislevite factions. Katrin does tend to survive if you're playing like Kostaltin. Uh, Kostaltin can actually end up dying to uh, the combination of Frat and Azazel if you don't deal with those issues. Um, but you do have a pre -star it's weak starring you. army. You do have some campaign benefits, but outside of the control benefit, it doesn't really matter. Yes, hero rank, it's useful, but it's not too significant. I score training duration doesn't really matter because you are very limited in how many mages you can have anyway. So it's nice to get some things faster, but Katrin's campaign benefits and Kostaltin's campaign benefits, their uh, their faction effects are not especially great. The ward save that Kostaltin does get for Patriarchs is the exception, but that's just Without about it. Question. As lords, like Mistress Katrin is one ice. of the weakest legendary lords in the game because she's a mage, but the magic she has isn't great. And her melee ability, she doesn't have the melee skill tree. If she had the melee skill tree, she would actually be a much better lord. Because, yeah, you would just ignore magic and go directly for that. And you could make her a pretty decent fighter. Especially because you do have the embodiment of winter for hit points, armor, and weapon strength. If you had the melee skill tree available. You don't. 
But we go even further. Kislev is the kind of faction that does have these special cities and then the minor pr uh, provinces of Kislev. Now, the minor provinces of Kislev are pretty useless because they only have minor settlements, whereas you actually want provincial capitals if you're playing as Kislev. The reason you want provincial capitals is that the cities, the unique cities of Kislev, they do have a lot of unique structures, but they're economically they're not going to give you a significant amount of money. Even with the Merchant Guild Hall, even with all the structures, the income they generate is not going to pay for the cost, for the money you're going to have to pour into these cities to actually make them useful. I mean, you do want to pour in the money because you do want all the benefits that you can get from these structures, like unit you know, recruitment, upkeep benefits for Ice Guard in this particular case. Like Catherine can recruit Star Guard and then Ice Guard from the same structure. That is a pretty significant benefit in her campaign. Uh, you do have various other benefits as well. So it's worth uh, investing in these cities, but they won't generate an economy for you. Here's the thing, though, as Kislev, we, and this is what makes Sabina, their campaign pretty miserable. So the provinces here are pretty queen. bad, but you can't ignore the situation in the north, because if you do, the factions here will swarm over you. Another thing to understand is if you're playing as Katrin and Castalt, and you don't care about the supporter system because it gives you control, leadership, and speed to all your armies, as well as diplomatic relations to other Kislevi factions. The thing is, though, this supporter system only works. You can only get supporters as long as the other faction is alive. So as Katrin, Castalta needs to be alive for me to actually get supporters uh, and you know increase the, increase the threshold here. Actually... This applies to every faction, like if you want to increase your supporters, you need to have uh, both Castalton and Katrin alive. So if you're playing as Boris Ursus and you confederate Castalton or Katrin, which you can, uh, then uh, you're going to be able, you're going to lose the ability of gaining supporters, which or, you won't necessarily lose the ability to gain supporters, but the benefits of the supporter system. Now, the Keep other issue when it comes to Catherine or Castalton is they can't confederate the other, which means that uh, until you get to 600 supporters, which is a pretty huge amount of supporters to get to, you might be spending dozens and dozens of turns, maybe over 70 turns, to be able to reach that threshold. On top of that, and yes, it does get even worse, your short campaign victory condition, which gives you a significant benefit in terms of hero capacity, so ice mages, more ice mages specifically, like patriarchs you'll have enough of, but ice mages, frost maiden heroes, um, they are fairly limited and they do require structure, so that short campaign victory condition is actually really worth it. Um, the thing is, you need to get those 600 supporters, so you need to achieve something that basically should win you the campaign, really. Why this is a short campaign victory condition as opposed to a long campaign victory condition, I don't understand. On top of that, you have the situation over here in the north. The problem of your starting position on Kislev is that it's very easy to get involved in a very vicious cycle here in the north where you're just endlessly fighting northern battles. And that's the last thing you want to do. Like, you do want to eliminate Frat and Azazel, that will do wonders in terms of stabilizing the situation for you here. Because you eliminate Frat, you give Helpit to Krakadrak, you eliminate Azazel, you give his capital to Castalton if you're playing as Katrin. If you're playing as Castalton, you do something else. I've gone over what you should in their campaigns. And you might want to eliminate one or two of Trog's armies. Once you do that, you basically get the hell out of here and you go conquer Dostromark, Sylvania, Trika, and Azak. You take all of their territory and you make that the economic heart. In fact, you might want to conquer the entirety of the Empire if you're playing a Kislev uh, campaign, including Blackwater, so that's Zufbar. It's your best campaign plan because Kislev, if they want to generate money, what they need, and I'll just uh, show you what I'm talking about here. Um, if you're playing as Kislev... What you really want to get are Victory, the provinces of the empire because they they will give you the economic support the that you will need. It's not like your I armies are so cheap that you can just afford having a lot of them. Kiss now, I feel yours. that this is not now, how a Kislev campaign should play as. I feel we more defense-oriented. I think they should be more similar to the Wood Elves. But instead, what you need to do is get proper provincial capitals, so like Bakehaven, uh, Drakenhof, Tempelhof, Zufbar. Uh, the reason you want to get those is because you want to get um, 
the roads, which give you tradable resources, which you can only get at tier 4. On top of that, you want provinces with trade resources. So Ostromark is a great example of this. Because the trade resources not only will give you more from trading partners and you'll generate more with getting a tier 4 settlement, but the trade resources themselves generate significant economic benefits for Kislev. Because Kislev's economic structures generate very little My income, position. but they do have a significant benefit through tradable resources if you acquire them. So if you acquire timber, if you acquire uh, pastures, if you acquire uh, pottery or any kind of trade resource in general, you'll gain significant benefits throughout uh, for your entire economy. And then you move on and deal with the north. But it is a complicated, situa complicated situation to deal with if you're playing as Catherine Costalton. The reason Boris Ursus gets, gets to deal with it, the reason his campaign is so much easier Boris, is because, okay. one, he has a much better starting army, so he can steamroll all of his enemies. It's not like dealing with Frat and Azazel is an easy affair, by the way. It isn't, unless you're playing as Boris Ursus, who has so many powerful Ooh, units from the very start of his campaign that he can steamroll them. Um, and on top of that, Boris Ursus can confederate Catherine or Costalton, uh, uh, or outright conquer them for their uh, great territory. And he also doesn't have to deal with the supporter system. The final issue is actually in involving the invocations. To get supporters, generally speaking, you want to invoke one of the gods. Ursin is the best one because it gives you five supporters when you're occupying a lot of a settlement. Um, but the Not problem so with devotion is you only gain devotion fi by fighting chaos factions by default, unless you're using a mod. Yes, mods can help improve a faction, but when we're judging the value of a faction, it's, it's always worth remembering how the baseline situation is. I personally, if I'm playing a key of campaign, I'm certainly using a mod that gives me devotion from fighting any faction pretty much but by default you only get it from uh, chaos which is a pretty big issue because one the more provinces the more regions you take the higher the devotion cost which is ridiculous because they're basically rights requiring a special faction resource and many factions that have these kind of resources do not get a cost increase the, the more territory they conquer so that's one of the ridiculous aspects of this particular campaign you need the supporters uh, but you need to invoke the gods to get those invocations and it's and those invocations are useful in other ways as well like specifically dash uh, uh, dash is great because he'll give you a significant economic benefit saliac is great if you need casualty replenishment though that shouldn't be an issue as key stuff, but it's also great because of the growth and you can improve these invocations as well through research the thing is if you're playing as key slave, a lot of the things you're going to need in your campaign require devotion the special structures in the key slave city require devotion the churches for your patriarchs which are really good because they give you casualty replenishment they require devotion but devotion is a rare resource and because these invocations cost more as you play your campaign as you conquer more territory is genuinely miserable to deal with it this is why boris Ursus is so oh, much so better than katarin karsalton because he doesn't have to care about the supporter system it says a lot about the campaign when one of the main features this bloody meter over here is something that he doesn't have to deal with and automatically his campaign is just that much better for it because that means he doesn't constantly need to keep the support uh, keep an invocation active to gain supporters he does he's not racing against anyone he can benefit he can get temporary buffs in his campaign with supporters by supporting either Catron or Costalting, giving them a bunch of supporters and by the way what's also great about Boris Ursus he can confederate them, uh, either country and Costalton, diplomatically. But what's great about him is because he can support one faction or another with supporters and AI cheats in general, he, if you're playing Boris, you can ensure that either Catherine or Costalton will reach the 600 supporters, automatically confederate the other one, and then you as Boris, you confederate them diplomatically. Or you can just confederate them diplomatically. If you're playing as Catherine or Casalt and you have a long miserable campaign ahead of you that's fairly tricky to actually deal with and it says a lot about creative assembly's handling of Kislev and their mechanics because there's a lot of things that should make Kislev a beginner friendly campaign there's 
this is one of those Daddy. races that Creative Assembly designed to be friendly for new players, like in terms of their army I roster, for instance, no. it's clearly designed for new player because of the hybrid units. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, oh, building, recruiting melee oh, units or range units, because many of Me. your units it's will be able to do both roles. Not especially well, I have to say, but they'll be able to do both roles. So Creative Assembly put quite a bit of thought, but they completely screwed it up. Kisev, like, this is the fact, this is the situation for a lot of the races that Creative Assembly introduced in Warhammer 3, with the exception of Cafe. They all need major reworks, from the Ogres to the Demons to Kislev, they all need major reworks, because right now they're in a really sorry state of affairs. But that's all there is to say. Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. And if you do enjoy my content, uh, please consider donating my PayPal or Patreon. I could really use your support, given everything that's happening around the world. And if you have ideas for future videos, things that you'd like to see me cover when it comes to Total War Warhammer, uh, please let me know in the comment section below. Stay tuned for more, everyone. Costine signing out.